I can't see it. Good evening. We are live today. Today, sorry, we're just a couple minutes late. Just working through a few issues here. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me. You see Dom here on my. Well, I guess it would be your right as well. Um, hang on one second. There, it says we are live. You see Dom here on my. Well, I guess it would be your right as well. Um, hang on one second. There, it says we are live. Hey, well, I guess it would be your right little as feedback well. there. Yeah, it's through my phone. Now my phone won't turn low. Yeah, you just got to mute the phone there. It won't let me. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, these won't. kind of technical problems happen all the time. So uh, it's uh, now it will. I got part it. of being on YouTube. Uh, it probably never okay. ever go away. Just uh, just one of those things. So if you come on. on okay, we should be set now. It looks like. <laughs> just trying to troubleshoot some issues. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, looks like between me and you, I've got a little delay because, but I think everything else is running. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I popped one of Dom's links in there as well. Most of you know him. If Dom's got a chance, he can pop it in there again to make sure that link looks like a very long link to be a link to your channel. So um, for me, that doesn't look quite right. Hopefully everybody is doing well. Um, obviously we know we've got a lot of issues going around. The topic is going to be uh, the future of reselling. There are some very interesting things going around right now, more than interesting, some more concern for folks in certain areas. Um, and I'm going to let Dom talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to go right into a few topics here because there is a lot going on. And if you're in certain fields, um, you'll see it more than anywhere else. Um, it, Dom and me are both comic guys. I love comics as well. That's just the start of this. And we're going to address some of the things going on from not necessarily a comic standpoint, but I'm going to use that as a starting point here for the conversation because many people aren't aware at all that this is going on. And if you don't collect certain things, you probably will. So let me swing it on over to Dom so Dom can introduce himself for those those who don't subscribe to Dom, subscribe, and off Dom goes here now. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Yeah, so my name's Dominic, uh, the primetime treasure hunter. Uh, Don and I have a lot of things in common. Uh, I love to go out and uh, you know do those treasure hunts, estate sales, garage sales, flea markets, uh, rummage sales, private picks, all sorts of things. Do a little online arbitrage once in a while too. And uh, like Don, I uh, also like to just put up uh, educational uh, videos, uh, hot takes, those uh, sorts of things. And so uh, we do have a lot of things in common. One of the things we have in common are comic books. I talk about that a lot on my channel, Don. Uh, brings it up every once in a while on his. And I think one of the things that is going to come um, out of this whole uh, pandemic once things settle down uh, more is uh, people across various industries, not only reselling, but also in the comic book industry, are going to realize more how they were putting too many of their eggs in one basket. Now, that's a topic that we've discussed as resellers beforehand, but sometimes it's like telling somebody that, you know, be thankful of what you have until you lose it. It's not until you actually lose it that you really realize how true that that is. And so, you know, in reselling, uh, a lot of people had their eggs in one basket with uh, having items in Amazon FBA. And then once uh, Amazon FBA decided to uh, shut down a lot of the incoming shipments uh, that were going through there, a lot of uh, Amazon FBA uh, resellers who were relying on that uh, realized that they had a big problem on their hands and the people uh, who were primarily selling on eBay and had direct control over their supply, uh, they were in great shape because they had all their stuff and USPS was still running and coming to their house. Well, in the comic book industry, uh, something similar has happened. If you don't know, uh, quite some time ago, a company called Diamond, uh, the Diamond Distributors, uh, they pretty much took over distributing uh, every single comic book, not only for uh, Marvel, but DC, Dark Horse, Image, all of them. They all go through Diamond. And so what that means is that every comic book retailer in the country is literally dependent on Diamond, one supplier for their entire business. And if that one supplier goes down, they are screwed. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Diamond actually took the unprecedented step of saying, we're done. We're not shipping out uh, comic books anymore. And most comic None. books. None. Yeah. 
You, you hear me? I was right to say they cut them all off, not just partial. They cut everything off. Total Distribution Network was shut down. What three weeks ago? Two yeah. weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah. So right. So everything they were distributing, I was just focused on comic books since we're mentioning comics. But um, and they also, by the way, have a, another um, like a subsidiary of their company that ships out uh, a, a lot of board games, and so a lot of board games were not uh, getting to where they needed to to go uh, as well. So. Anyway, it is a, a very big problem because what this meant is that the comic book retailers who were reliant on those new issues to come out to bring in new traffic, um, they didn't they don't have that anymore. Now, yeah, once in a while you get some people who come in for back issues, but most of these stores are really dependent on those new issues to come out. Um, now, if you are a comic book store that specialized in back issues and didn't rely on a new comics coming coming in then you would be in a better position uh but for most of the uh, retailers uh you know they were really dependent on diamond and those new issues so uh going forwards uh for physical comic book uh media and I, I say physical because there are digital comic books that are out. And for example, Marvel has decided to release a comic book now in digital form. And so that's how people are getting their fix. But people like me I, I can't read digital comic books. I have to have, you know, the original, I have to have the physical copy, the original in my hands to read it. It's a totally different experience. There's the smell of the comic book, the feel of the comic book. You're just not going to get that in digital format. And so um, uh, going forward, I think once the dust settles from all this, one of the things that's going to happen is that um, there's going to be a big push to make a more even distribution of uh, comic books and, and and board games and other kind of related uh, collectible items so that um, retailers are not solely dependent on one particular company to get uh, all of their items. Because Diamond's message to, to all these retailers said, basically literally said, what you have left right now, that's your business. So get creative on how to sell that stuff. That That's what they told them. So... Uh, and by the well, way, Marvel, Marvel. The only last point I was going to say: the comic you know. retailers are furious. Well, if if you know who Kevin Smith is, and I'm sure yep. there was a good right. podcast on. I had it on. Um, I think it was two nights ago, maybe or something like that. Um, there's thousands of comic, and, and we're gonna. I'm gonna steer away from comics in just a moment here, but. I, this is the basis on on distribution for pretty much anything. There's distribution networks for everything, and um, with with this, you've got a couple thousand independent comic book stores that are not tied to anybody specific, just like uh, me or Dom or anybody watching this that have their own shop, and that's how they pay their bills. They're now incurring the fees, obviously, for the shop. They've got no merchandise coming in because, again, as Dom said, and, and anybody who's in the comics knows that that what drives your business are the new lines that are coming out, the hot titles, the hot everything. And, you know, the sad part on this is that Hollywood's made a fortune off of incurments into the, the superhero line after it had been called nerds and all this other stuff for all these years. So they made out like a bandit, but the, the people who promoted the whole industry are going to be suffering. Most comic stores, if you haven't been into one these days, they sell action figures and all of these sorts of things. All of that chain of distribution is now interrupted because the biggest problem, at least for other things besides comics, comics are at least mostly printed in the U.S. The biggest problem with a lot of the other stuff, like all the toys and, and all that other stuff that, that we sell, even electronics, is it comes from China and, and overseas. In Asian market is a lot of where this comes from. No, no, you know, discrimination. I'm not trying to call out anybody. That's just the facts. Like with the medical stuff, we know that like 90 some odd percent of most of what we use, including medicines, comes from overseas. Now you've got the biggest industrial area overseas was shut down for three months. So you've got to stop on everything pretty much that was produced over there. And even stuff like toys and stuff will take second nature to the stuff that's important right now. So this is going to be a disruption of getting merchandise for months to come. And it may, you know, with even our government directing like GM to produce ventilators and stop production of this and, you know, retool machines and all this other stuff, it's happening all over the place. So this is going to be something that's going to be a long 
for, you know, a lot of people is, is the point of this. Now, you know, there's tons of stuff to do. There's never going to be a, a, a spot where there's no resellers doing something. The, the, the biggest take on it in my book, just looking at it from friends who own shops, jewelry stores. I know people who own jewelry stores. You've seen videos of me in them. Um, they're going to be hurt because you're just going to be buying stuff, you know, at a higher price because gold is up now, silver's up now. This is just another example. So we're going to all, as a reseller, you're going to have to be creative and really thinking outside the box. But this is a good time because, again, it's going to separate those who aren't serious about this from those who are. The ones who aren't serious are going to be giving up and working other ways out to, to make an income. And again, I'm not wishing in any ill harm on anybody. But the point of it is this is going to be something that's a long term effect because it they locked down in, in China and in, in Wuhan in the end of December. And, you know, we're months past that now. We're on month four and they're just now easing restrictions. So you've got a three month hold on all kinds of collectibles and things like that. And from like a U.S. perspective, in my my thinking and, and from talking to people around here, people who run places like thrift stores, one just opened up maybe six months or less ago here. They're, they're, they're going to be possibly out of business because you're talking two or three months where they're not going to be having revenue. People aren't going to be donating as much items because they're going to have to let stuff run a little longer because again a lot of people are out of money right now so you saw sure the videos on the news about people lining up at the food banks it was like a 10 mile backup some humongous thing here in this country uh, again because now what's what's the total what 16.6 million people filed for unemployment three weeks and it might go up next week even farther for all we know. Again, I'm not wishing any ill harm on anybody else, but it's going to take some creativity from everybody to go through this. People aren't going to want to donate as because they're not going to be buying new stuff to replace it right away. You got Christmas coming down the line. You know, again, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can switch stuff off. Wholesalers and things like that are still out there for certain goods as long as you're paying attention to what's going going on. But I mean, you're, you're going to have to look out towards the future big time now, because again, we still can't say how this is going to shake out. Uh, we all know that there's a disruption. I mean, the comic book one was a shocker a few weeks ago when I saw the first article on that. Marvel Comics has now cut off a third of their production. They're not going to work on a third of their line of comics through the end of June right now. And that's a, a pretty far ways out. Digital might kill some more stuff. There's articles right now. Is this the death of the comic book market? You know, gum cards and baseball cards, same same kind of issues are going to happen. If factories are closed, you're going to have a big disruption. So sports card collector shops could have issues. Coin shops haven't had merchandise coming in for a while. They're not buying. They're not selling again because they're shut down in, what, 48 states, I think, now have a stay-at-home order or something like that. So we're going to have a major disruption. I'm not going to be prone to rush out right as over either to go to a thrift store because, again, we know from history that pandemics can happen again and again, and you got to be safe. So uh, anyway, I don't want to go into politics or anything like that, but um, what's your take on, on where we're going with this right now, Don? What, what, what's your thinking on that? Um, I think... Um really i th i think there's really still so many unknowns at this point uh i think we do have some positive uh trends in the data right now that um things may be coming to a, a peak soon an apex and then we're going to go in this either plateau phase and then kind of slowly go down uh, a bit so it's still going to be a while until probably not until late spring maybe summerish based on data right now um, where things will even start to get somewhat um close to how things were before um but you know depending on how long it goes out and again it's it still is an unknown the more and more people have to start dipping into their personal savings uh to get by if they're on uh, un you know unemployment and you know they just need to make ends meet I do think the more and more there is, uh, again, not wishing any ill will on anyone, like Don says, but I think there that there is, that is going to raise some 
opportunities for, for purchasing uh, for resellers who do have the means to do so because um, if we basically become like banks for people. Um, that's what thrift stores and pawn stars are like, uh, pawn uh, shops, pawn stars, pawn shops are like for uh, people who, um, you know, need m money in, a, in, in times of uh, desperation, in, in times where they are, you know, down on their luck, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so I would suggest that if you do have the means to do so, uh, that you start putting up some uh, private ads on a place like uh, Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, uh, getting yourself ready for that to, you know, just put an ad out there, letting people know that, you know, if they need cash and, um, you know, if they have stuff, if they have lots of things, if they have collectibles and stuff that, you know, you would be willing to, to purchase those types of things. Uh, these are, um, you know, of course, situations where you'd want to make sure you're practicing uh, proper social distancing and that sort of stuff and not putting yourself in any kind of serious risk. So you, you've got to be very careful and you got to time it just right. But in the future, you know, it's not like there's going to be a light switches on, light switches off, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, everything is uh, totally back 100%. There's going to be people who are suffering uh, even when things go back, you know, closer to normal when we start easing into it. People are going to need funds. And, you know, as, as resellers, if you have the opportunity, if you have the means to do so, there's going to be purchasing opportunities out there for you that probably would not have been there, at least in this degree. Um, if this didn't happen. So there's always silver linings in everything that's bad. And our job as resellers is to try to find where those things are. Yeah, th that's a good point. Um, let me just call it a thank you to Chris Gatwood for the uh, Super Chat 499. Thank you very kindly. My chat is like running really terrible. So if I don't get into the chat too much, it's literally I'm using off what's going on here, which is kind of a nuisance. But uh, anyway... With, with that, there there's going to be opportunities to purchase. I'm getting calls right this very second from people, other resellers that I've dealt with who just can't afford and asking if I'd be willing or interested in buying merchandise, you know, some of their inventory and things like that. And I've been having people ask that for a while. So I do say that there will be some opportunities, whether from that case or not. Now, one thing I'd, I'd say here is I've saw several people talking about, you know, this should be better time after this is all done. One thing I can say I've learned from working around people, the rich folks with a lot of money is they don't like to spend it. And I don't see a lot of them donating it as much around here. I used to be able to go to like a certain end of town. That's totally been done with. It's just not feasible anymore at all around here. Any of the stores, thrift stores are all So, I don't know where this is going to shake out because no one in their lifetime has experienced this before. So my take on it is everybody is going to be frugal with their money from this point on. People aren't going to be buying stuff, especially, you know, like Dom's saying too, this, this is going to go into summer with all practicality it's like, because the numbers are still going up. Again, no ill harm or anything meant towards anybody. I mean, it's tough no matter where you're at. Um, one thing I can say is I am so glad I wasn't working in a restaurant as a general or something like that because I wouldn't have a job now. So I completely can tell you that the reseller market is something that's a viable market. I'm making, we're still selling a lot of stuff, way more than I thought we would. Our numbers are right where they should be if this wasn't going on, which I'm totally shocked. I know it's only a few weeks into it. I sell a lot of stuff that demographic wise are an older crowd to some extent again no disrespect whatsoever i'm considered a senior citizen probably at this point as well so uh, again demographics of what you sell can mean a big difference in in selling stuff still so again I, i've talked about it dom knows it just as well most people that sell vintage collectibles they sell all year round it's something that people still collect they're not going to stop collecting it no matter what, because that's what they do. That's their hobby. That's they don't go to a sports game. They don't watch a football game on TV. They're going to collect something, you know, that's where their money goes. So, you know, cautious wise, I would be looking right now, truthfully, if there's any type of opportunity, I've discussed this in the Patreon on my Patreon as well, but you're going to have to think outside the box. I can tell you 100%. I just, 
in my area, the, the thrifts, there's going to be a thrift store too that closes in, in probably within somebody's area who's watching this right now over this just by sheer overhead. You're running the same bills, whether they get a loan for it or not. If you get a loan for two months and your, your sales don't go up at all, you're going to be paying off two months worth of rent or whatever you've got for months on end to catch back up. So it's not going to be a short term, even if all of this is done and we're able to do whatever we want and be out in public without worry and concern. There, there's, there's an underlying factor that's, that's should be of concern, but again, no panic issue at this point, because if you're, you really want to do this, you're going to find a way to make the money and find something to sell, I guess is the point, you know, always be investigating, spend this time researching and figuring out stuff. And I've even seen quite a few people, even in the feed, talking about the uh, sales. I, again, sales are pretty good. How is your sales doing? And again, I'm not. I don't want to belittle anybody who's not having great sales. I'm. I'm. The point of it is that it depends on what you sell and how you do your business as to how your sales are going to be. W what's yours looking like? I'm not asking for figures. I just are you still comparable to what you would have normally been? Yeah, in fact, uh, March was about 33% uh, over the prior month, which was interesting. Um, one of the trends that I had personally noticed and talked about on my channel and uh, then saw other people reporting the same thing was that initially when it happened and um, started to go more you know, nationwide and people started to realize the significance of what was going on, everyone started rushing out for toilet paper, hand sanitizer, all that uh, type of stuff. Uh, it was basically at that point, uh, people were mentally in and psychologically in stockpile mode. That's where they were. They were they were focusing in on those bare essentials and they were not buying much of anything else at that time in general for most people. Uh, and so then once that started to settle down and people started to feel a bit more a bit more calm uh, and realizing this was going to last for a while and they were going to be stuck at home for a while. They got their essentials. They're all stockpiled with everything. You know, they're loaded. They're ready for pair. And they're now just find themselves sitting home and they're in front of their laptop. And what do they start doing? They start looking for stuff. Now, a lot of those people were looking for stuff on Amazon and eventually started to realize that even with Amazon Prime, that there was a month delay in which you were going to get your items. And so what a lot of those people started to do is they then switched over to eBay to get their items. This has been a big silver lining and ironic blessing for eBay. I mean, my goodness, it, eBay is going to come out a winner out of this whole thing. And you hate to say winner, given all the people that are dying and all the sickness and everything like that. But like I said, there's always positives and negatives that come out of, that come out of everything. And I think there's going to be something that uh, eBay could try to seize the moment and, and grow with. But uh, what happened is that uh, eBay sellers started to see their sales uh, go up. And some people were making record sales, uh, and, you know, sales better than they had ever had uh, for like a weekend or something like that. So, um, you know, that's basically where things kind of still are right now for, for, for a lot of people is that, you know, people are still sitting at home and they're, they're looking on eBay. People who used it in the past are coming back to it. People who had never used it are coming back to it. And also um, that's not only for purchasing, but that's also for selling. So one thing I do think, Don, that's going to happen when this all, you know, again, when the dust settles, and I don't think it's bad, some people think it's bad, is there is going to be more competition. But as I explained in a recent video, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you don't follow best practices, but it's going to force people to raise their game. And, um, you know, competition is a good thing. I've, I've explained that in terms of, you know, in terms of why before. Um, but, uh, you know, you really can't, you really can't grow with that. And so, uh, but I think that's going to be on the horizon. We're going to see more people on the platform selling uh, than, than there was previously. Yeah, I agree on that partially. Um, again, we have, everybody has different takes on it. My thinking is there will be more sellers selling the everyday average new stuff that they find around their house. Again, because I do see an increase in that kind of stuff, but people selling vintage and stuff like that, I'm getting calls from them to buy their merchandise, buy out their store right now. I think for me, it's going to be less competition selling what I sell and the majority of what I sell with what I share with you than, than anything. Because again, the, the people who are selling it on, online right this minute trying to recoup money, can't go out and source vintage items. They're sourcing what's around their house. So again, 
those areas like clothing is going to be more flooded than it was. And, you know, home goods and things like that, because that's what people are selling now. Books are selling like mad uh, records. Oh, my God. I can't tell you how many records. I'll probably pump some out to um, Instagram just to show you some posts. But I've been selling. We're double 78 sales than I have in probably months. I'm selling double what I was and talking about like my first quarter is usually the same as fourth quarter. So I do Christmas sales all the way through the first three months of the year. Usually anyway, I'm right up there like a Christmas, the week before Christmas sales week right now. So I, I can't complain, but again, I had to switch up everything we're doing and stop listing new and stop listing this and stop listing that we switched up our other store with some stuff. I got five people less working for me now. So it's been a big ordeal, but it's gone now where it needs to go. So, um, yeah. you know, there, there's there's goods and bads. About it. You know, if like what I saw, as I said, I, I'm going to have less competitors here in my local area for sure. Again, I've gotten probably half a dozen calls from some, including one guy that I've had as a competitor in my local area that shows up at every sale I've ever been to pretty much that's done with it. He can't, he can't do it anymore. He's older. He doesn't want to risk going to these places. He's done, you know? So that's my concern. Somebody um, passed away from one of the flea markets from the virus around here. So I don't know what the flea markets are going to be like. Somebody else I know has been sick. I finally heard from him after three different uh, contacts. He finally got back in touch with me and he's okay. But, but the point of it is a lot of people in these areas may not be out there doing the same thing. Flea markets might be affected across the board, at least in my area. Again, these are all regional issues. You know, your area may be totally different. Most of the flea markets around where I go to are all older folks, all of them. You know, I don't think there's many young vendors there. If I set up at one of them, I might be the youngest person at some of these places. Um, you know, and I, I got to take that into consideration. Again, demographics are a huge factor. You know, when you're looking at your YouTube figures, demographics are all over the place. You know, demographics mean a lot. And I've used that to my benefit to steer to items that I know that aren't going to be affected by um, people not getting a paycheck. You know, that's that's a big key thing why I've pretty much specialized in stuff that's a collectible specifically. I used to do clothing, for God's sake. That's all we did for scanning books, clothing, and FBA stuff. I don't do most of that anymore because it's just not where I get most of my money anymore, and I don't have any slowdowns this way. I mean, the, the biggest take is to look outside the box. It's not over. It's not done. Reselling is going to be a hot commodity no matter what. It's going to be probably hotter in some areas, as I said, you know, and, and like Dom's saying too, there is going to be more competition in some areas, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, things to think about. If somebody's just now getting into reselling, they're not going to get their money right away. There's holds and all kinds of other stuff to think about. There's going to be people that are just doing it now and all these other aspects of it. So it, it's a mixed bag with no solid, unfortunate answers in it. All we can do is look at other like recessions and things like that and see where we can go to that. Again, this blows all that else out of the water by a factor of what 10. So I wouldn't even begin to know, but I can tell you that if you're not looking outside the box right now and you're not thinking about two or three months from now, what you're going to do, you know, you better start now. You got a lot of time to do this and, you know, brain power is going to be your biggest factor. Now use all the brain power you can to figure out what to do with this. And, and I'm telling you that, just with a little bit of time and energy, you can figure your way out of this or figure your way to getting that revenue coming back in. I mean, again, it depends on where you're at in your business. If you're just starting off, you're going to have a little harder time, of course. You want to piggyback on that? Yeah. with? Yeah, no. I mean, some of the things I've been thinking about as you've been uh, talking just to bounce off of it is that, um, you know, you mentioned old timers and, um, you know, this disease has affected and killed the elderly uh, far more uh, than younger people, even though younger to middle-aged people still have been affected by it. But, you know, it is really the elderly folks with, um, you know, other complicating medical conditions who have had the highest mortality rates. And so it really remains to be seen in the areas where we work, how many of those elderly people who were you know, selling at flea markets uh, are no longer going to be there anymore, no longer going to be vendors who are available. How much of that is going to now be replaced with younger vendors? The other thing to think about too is how, you know, if those people pass away, those people had stuff. Where is that stuff going to go? 
is that are the, does that mean there's going to be more estate sales uh, down the road? And with estate sales, don't always think that they just immediately get sold off. I mean, at that magician's estate sale that I went to, that that magician had passed away ten years prior to me going to the sale. So sometimes someone passes away. And whoever is in charge of the estate will just keep the estate as is, just kind of manage it for a while and then wait till things settle. And then later on, we'll have the estate sell. So there actually could be, you know, a bunch of more vintage uh, types of uh, items that are coming on the on the market, uh, you know, down the road. So, you know, definitely be on the, on the lookout for more estate sales if you haven't ventured into those before, if it's something new for you. Uh, if you see them popping up more in your area, I would highly suggest uh, going by them once things are safer. Yeah, that's that's definitely so. Um, I don't see as much probably old vintage stuff rushing to a thrift store around me. Again, my thrift stores are mostly terrible all the time. Flea markets, though, are my my wonder and, and thought, as is our estate sales again, because if I go to an estate sale that's at a vintage house, I'm like, 99% guaranteed I'm going to get something worth some money there that I can resell. I don't think I've been to an estate sale um, that I haven't made a lot of money on. And again, I'm selective if I go. I look at the photos online. There's three sites I use and the whole works. There's tons of opportunities still with that. Maybe they'll limit how many people are in at a time, but they do that now anyway. I've been to estate sales where you know, you got to pick a number where you're at in line and then they only let like 20 people in at a time and on and on and on. You got to kind of have a, a in. I know most of the ones who do it around here, at least. So I've done it for so long. You know, I'm going to lose a, a picker for sure. He says he's not messing with it anymore. He doesn't want to risk it. All it takes is one to get the virus and pass away. Unfortunately, somebody who I knew did pass away from this at one of the, or from the flea market. We were going to go to it too. That was his last one. I did not go. I did not, you know, anyway, it wasn't, wasn't worth the risk in my book. I still honestly feel there's going to be some people that are going to be worried months after this, you know, about a second wave possibly, you know, who knows? We don't know that the, the, again, the point is I'm ready for whatever is going to happen. I'm constantly doing projections and seeing where I'm at on a daily basis, two, three times a day these days. I'm constantly hammering out offers to watchers. You know, on top of that, I, I've said this in another video for, again, for same reasons it's like Dom's talking about people are home and they're Auctions are a thing again. I, I've never had much luck in the last couple of years on auctions. Everybody just wants everything right now, it seems. I've been running auctions and, and auctions have been doing very, very well because again, now people have the time. Um, auctions used to be the only option you had and it used to be a big thing. People had something to look forward to. Yeah, I'm gonna win this. Where's the price going? Everybody's sitting around and enjoying the auctions again, it seems, because as soon as I run some auctions, I got bids, I got you know, people hollering out, I got massive amounts of watchers, more watchers than I had when the items were up just as a bin. So. You know, there's other things you can try. It doesn't have to be bins, at least right now, because again, people have time. So it, it's a good thing to do that. Um, yeah. Another uh, thing. I, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Don. No, go ahead. You sure? Yeah, yeah. I was, okay, gonna I was just going to pick it up. to another area. So. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to give folks some data. If you haven't seen this, uh, I posted it the other day in my Facebook group, uh, the Facebook Reselling Resource Center. And um, it's also is some data that was, pu was published to eBay. It was on e-commerce bytes. Uh, and it's uh, it confirms something that uh, Don and I have both been talking about for a while, which is by far the number one uh, selling item right now on eBay is puzzles. Uh, makes complete sense. You know, people are home. They need something that takes a long time to uh, pass the time, something that you could do with somebody else. And it's also something that is uh, mentally stimulating. So people love uh, puzzles and searching for puzzles. Make sure, by the way, you put the number of pieces in your title for puzzles, because I've seen people uh, make the mistake of not doing that this way. So there, when people are doing a search, that it comes up, because otherwise, you know, it won't come up if you don't put the uh, the, the puzzle uh um, a piece count in there. But uh, one of the things Don and I have also talked about are certain toys like Lego building toys. Those had an 86% increase. Puzzles saw an 813% uh, 
uh, increase in terms of uh, what people are looking for. By far the biggest uh, increase. Uh, other things, if you have these things laying around the house, um, you know, don't toss them out. Don't put them in a bin waiting to get donated. Look and see if they're worth anything. So uh, strength training is number two, 694% increase. Webcams, I saw someone mention that earlier in the chat, Don. Uh, people need those things because they need to connect with people. Cool. Uh, 673% increase. Strength training is obvious as well because you know people are home. They still want to exercise. They can't go to the YMCA. Some people don't feel safe going outside. You know, They're not going to go to a park, that kind of stuff. Uh, number four, a lot of people are doing home projects like painting. So if you have extra paintbrushes around, painting equipment, supplies, all that type of stuff, people are looking for that to buy it. They don't want to go out to Ace Hardware. They don't want to go out to Home Depot. They just want to buy it from you on eBay. So if you have that stuff in your closet, dig it up and start selling that stuff. 194% uh, increase in that. Cardio equipment, 181% increase. Laptop docking stations and power adapters. People need those, of course, especially if they're uh, on the fritz. They need to get a new one. So they may need the one you have, that extra one that's laying around your closet that you're not using anymore. Uh, golf training aids. A lot of people want to, you know, be home, work on their golf game, looking forward to when they can get out. So they have like a little putting station, you know, those kind of gifts that you got, uh, you know, from somebody that you maybe you never wound up using like one of those golf games or something, or uh, you just never quite got around to it. If you need some cash, put that stuff up. That's seen a 119% increase wireless routers and mobile hotspots. Those are huge right now. So uh, if you have those old, even the older routers around, people are looking for that and virtual reality headset. So a lot of people won't have that around, but if maybe you're a gamer, you had stuff like that around um, that and you don't need it anymore. Um, those types of things are selling really well also. So that's just an example of what Don was uh, talking about when he said, think outside the box, these might have not have been topics or things that you would have thought, you know, would be something that would have sold, sold well before. But right now, those things are top, top hot sellers. Yeah, the, definitely, definitely the case. Um, like with puzzles, I've sold, I don't think I even have a puzzle in stock anymore. And I had a bunch of those models were selling. Mm -hmm. I sold a whole bunch of models, uh, car kit models, um, I sold some slot cars, a whole bunch of slot cars for top dollar. They didn't even make an offer. They just bought them and they've been up forever too. We've been selling just the, the stuff that's been setting has been the stuff that's been selling a lot too. But of course we move stuff around and switch things up just because, um, stuff isn't selling your store. There may be other reasons too. your photos, your title, even prices, prices go up and down all year round. We change and check our prices constantly. Um, so that's a big thing to do too. The three keys to your listing, I said it before, your photo, title, and your price. Those are all tied and stuck to that listing. So if you mess with those, you can adjust where you're coming at in a search. That's the biggest thing. I change words and stuff in listings constantly too. Um, have somebody else look at them. You know, that's another thing. Have somebody else look at your listings and stuff. I do notice too with eBay and the white backgrounds that they are seeming to pop up people that have more white, clear, obvious uh, uh, photos than the ones that have those, the junky photos. I've seen a difference in what shows up when you search as to that. So if your photos have a bunch of stuff cluttered, it's not just the object that you're selling, but other stuff, I would address those issues too, because eBay is going to be pushing those. They want to be Amazon, whether they say it or not. And Amazon your listings, your every photo you put on Amazon has, has to have 85% of that photo has to be the item you're selling. The rest of that, the other 15% has to be white and nothing else that is not included in that, that sale can be included in the photos. I'm telling you with eBay doing the white background, one day it's going to be like that at eBay. I would just almost guarantee you because they've copied everything else. It's a good time now to work on your photos, work on your lighting, see how you can improve it. If you've got other stuff cluttering up your images, fix that. That will help you. I mean, at least from what I see on search results. I spent a lot of time researching. I spent a lot of time looking up items. And if you look, you're going to see higher prices. You're going to see stuff at the top just on a random search. More so if it has a plain, easy to see, you know, nice quality image, you know. DPI 300 or better was my personal recommendation. Um, you know, make sure the lighting's right. I mean, I'm telling you that that is a huge factor just in general, even if we weren't going through all this, if you're not adjusting and 
spending the time while you have the time to do that. You might have to go back and shoot a whole bunch more photos or scan stuff. We scan stuff that we photoed in the back in the day. Now we scan it all. So we've been going through and pulling up stuff and just doing the new photos. And that helps them sell many cases, 10 or 15% of our items that we rescan sell right away. You know, so that just pretty much proves that there is a, a stake in your photos. eBay is looking at that much higher and much more as a key factor than they ever have in the past in my book. So, you know, even if you can't source, even if, you know, your, the competition goes up or whatever, there's still things you can do to stand out from everybody else. I mean, that's the biggest point. Again, that's thinking outside the box. Most people may not think of that or, or dig into it, but that's a huge thing that you need to be doing for sure in my book anyway. Yeah. Take advantage of the time, uh, organize, clean, um, look into other projects that you've been putting off for a while that now you could do to your around the house more. Uh, maybe you were thinking of starting a YouTube channel, just never had the time to kind of look into it. Uh, this would be a good time to uh, you know explore that some more, do some test videos, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe you wanted to sell on another platform and um, you know you just never had the time to do that before, but now you find yourself with more home time. Again, perfect time to uh, try to explore those other things. Um, some other things people have been mentioning in the chat that um, we've also talked about before, uh, Don and I, but just to reiterate, they didn't necessarily show up in that list, but they're also great sellers of uh, video games. You know, if your kids have old video games around, they're not playing anymore or go through it with them. Say, hey, you know, Johnny, Sally, you know, let's get to let's get all these games out. Which ones do you guys don't want anymore? And, uh, you know, get those listed. Um, you know, it's just sitting around. It's money on the it's money sitting there right on the shelf for you. Um, health and beauty products are huge sellers right now. Huge. Some people are making record sales just on that alone. So if you have a lot of that stuff around, people are definitely looking for uh, for that. Uh, board games are doing very well uh, also. Um, so Don, I was going to segue into something a little bit different just in terms of since you know the video is about what's going to happen in the future. I had um, you know two things that I think are going to change uh, going forwards. I, I kind of touched on one of them before, but I kind of just want to reiterate one of them and then go into uh, another one if you don't mind. Go ahead, shoot. Yeah. So I think one, when, again, I use this term when, when the dust settles. So when, when the dust settles and people reflect back on this, I think one of the things that's going to happen is people are going to have a completely different view on what was previously referred to disparagingly as dead stock or death piles. And now they're going to look at those things as, uh, health piles or life piles, they're going to get a different name because having that residual inventory is so critical when something like this happens, which is obviously extreme, but you never know what's going to happen. Um, it could be something local in your city, in your state. There could, be, you, there could be a medical problem that happens to you where you can't go out and source anymore, but it really is important to have a, a bunch of inventory. I'd say a healthy amount of inventory, not a hoarder amount of inventory, but a healthy amount of inventory that could sustain you during a period of emergency. Um, my personal uh, philosophy with things, when you, if you saw me on my channel going out and getting things, as I always said to myself, if I needed to, in a worst case scenario, if for some reason I lost my full-time job, if there was some drastic emergency, like worst case planning scenario, I want to make sure that I have uh, enough inventory available at my uh, place of, of residence that I could literally open up a store, literally could open up a physical store. And so, you know, I'm at that point, like, you know, Don is as well. We could literally not source for years and be able to oh, yeah. sell, sell stuff. So, so, so that's one thing. And the other thing I think that will come out of this uh, beyond that is that I think that people will, start to maintain higher levels of items uh, in their store that could sustain them. Because if you do want to sell more, you do need to list more. And if you only have a hundred items or 50 items or, you know, 150, 200 items, that's going to make it harder for you to sustain things. If you need to have a regular flow of income coming in. So I think you're going to see more people bumping up how much they're selling. And hopefully it's quality items. Cause if you have 500 or a thousand 
crappy things, that's not going to matter. But if, if you could increase the amount of you know good profitable items, I think more people are going to try to do that so they could continue to have a reliable flow of income coming in, e even if they find themselves unexpectedly in an emergency situation like this. So I, I think that's two things that um, should happen going forwards. Well, let me just call out a quick thank you to Carl. Carl, thank you for the $5 super chat. And I've got Carol there as well for a $9.99. Thank you both for the super chat. I, I was hesitant to even, you know, make a comment on that because I don't want anybody spending money that they don't, you know, possibly have a use for. So, you know, again, um, <laughs> one, one thing just as a side note, if you're unaware, if you're on YouTube, I don't know how Dom's channel is on that, but on YouTube, your revenue dollars are down because no one's advertising because they're not selling stuff. So just FYI on that one. Um, but on the, the back stock issue, I call it back stock. I've always called it back stock. <laughs> right. I've got enough, literally like Dom said, I could sit here for a couple of years, especially without employees. Now I don't have just, but our family, no one can come over and work right now. I could list for years on the stuff that we have right now. That's not, I'm, I'm not a hoarder because it's all organized. It's all shelved. It's all separated by what it is. It's literally like the back of a, a building, a regular brick and mortar store is what I have on this. It's essential. Just like Dom saying, I figured out years ago that either I'm going to play that I'm going to have to run out all the time and buy all kinds of stuff and constantly flip and flip and flip and flip and flip wholesale FBA and all that stuff, which again, there's a lot of money to be made in it. It just depends on what you sell or I can, you know, go for different style or different types of items that I don't have to worry about that stuff. Stuff I pay little for that's going to sell constantly, that'll have an influx. But to do that second thought, to, to sell stuff constantly and, and pay little for it, you've got to have quantity up. You've got to have a massive quantity up of stuff. We've got, what, 70 some odd thousand items. I, I I could probably not list anything for this whole time and still have a real good reasonable sell through you know rate with what we're selling without having that issue. So it all depends on what thinking where you want to go with this. There's people who have just a couple couple items out at any time, and those couple items are enough to make them a, a good living at doing this. It just depends on what you do. My my way was to put a whole bunch of items up and to get massive quantities up. Again, because I sell, you know, a ton of items a day, regardless of what's going on, regardless of the season. So you either got to step up your game and, and think outside the box. Again, I was at, you know, zero listings. I was at 100 listings once. I was at 250 listings. I was at 500 listings. All I could see was having to do more and more and more and more to get more items in to alleviate it. Because most of what I put up is passive income. I put it up. I list it and then I forget about it. I don't have to think about it. I'll come back in and check prices, as I said here and there. But I'm looking at overall prices and category prices. I'm not usually having to peck at each individual listing and things like that, too. So um, let me, I see a couple other folks in here. Carl, uh, hang on, my feed's just terrible. Well, thank you for the, the $15. Then I got Carol with a the CEO, Don. That's the CEO's in the house. She's coming over to support you. <laughs> well, I appreciate it very, very much. Um, it, it, it's it's nice and, and it feels great to know that you guys appreciate the conversation enough to uh, support it in that way. Again, it's not required at all in any way, shape or form. Um, again, I forget it's even there until somebody does one. I don't promote most of my stuff. I very rarely even, I mean, I have post links, but I always forget to call it out or say something. I got a Patreon page, as most people know, but um, anyway, quantity for me is what, what made it. Again, thank you guys all for the super chat, guys, gals, and, and the works. Um, quantity, though, is, is what made it for us. If it wasn't for quantity, I don't know where I would be at at this point. Once we got quantity in one store, I was able to do another store, and then I don't have to worry about this stuff because I can cover it from both angles. I've got the quick flip. I got the, the um, wholesale lots. I got the FBA stuff. And then I still have the constant residual income from passive listings. I mean, that's, that's how I do it. I know Dom's been working on it and I know he's been doing a lot of listings besides 
All right, you guys, come on, Carl. A twenty-five dollar one. We're not trying to turn this into a big fight tonight. Triple, triple I boom, mean, I, triple boom. <laughs> I, I, I honestly and sincerely do appreciate it. Sometimes it's it's humbling for me because I'm not that the person who who asked for that kind of stuff. I guess I, I feel weird sometimes, but I honestly and sincerely thank you guys. I mean, it does it 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 means a lot, and I honestly sincerely mean that. I mean. It's hard to say. Is that Pink Panther back to you? It is, this is baby Pinky, Don. I don't know if you saw it because Carl bought the big Pink Panther and then that. Carol got little Pinky. And so then one of my uh, fans, Mountain Man Treasure, uh, uh, Troy Shockley, he sent this over to me because he said, it's just not right you not having a, a, a Pink Panther. So he sent me a little one. In fact, Carol wanted to know, Don, if you have a Pink Panther anywhere in your uh, you know, in your Actually, I do. I got a little tiny one. It's about this tall, and its head bounces up and down, and you pull the cord, and he talks. You might have. We, we you should. Have you should I, I don't think you, uh, you cut off. Me. No, I, no, I haven't. I got a Pink Panther uh, board game. I've got a Pink Panther puzzle, a frame puzzle, and I got a couple Pink Panther things here. But I do have a talking 1974 Pink Panther. Um, I don't know what it, I don't know. I don't remember the name, but you had a similar one. It wasn't Pink Panther. Um, you pull it in its mouth, jabbers up and down. Kind of yeah. reminds me of Jabberjaw from Hanna-Barbera. Yeah, the shark. Yeah, Jabberjaw. I used to yeah. watch all that stuff too. Oh yeah, love okay, Jabberjaw. Let's, I want to step off the side for just a minute here. and you, you gotta go get, things, Are you going to go get Pink no, Panther? No, it'd, take, it'd take me too long. I'd have to run all the way upstairs and everything. I was just going to say a lot of this stuff that like Pink Panther, for example, he's got a nostalgic base, a nostalgia around him. He's an American icon. He's he's part of the um, culture of, of America to some extent. And so are most of these characters. That's why they've been around so long. That's another reason why this stuff, the stuff that I sell, the stuff that Dom sells, comic books are nostalgia. So these are things that I grew up on. I bought comic books Every every quarter, every every cent extra that I had, I'd go down and buy a comic book with. Every dime I may or earned or whatever I did through all my childhood, I bought comic books and gum cards and action figures with. <laughs> Part of the reason this stuff always sells is because people have a nostalgic tie to it. Now, in in college, my my master's thesis was on um, the influence of music on the masses. I did a big long thing about it. I addressed it and stuff. The point of, of bringing that into this is that's all nostalgia, too. It's all cultural studies wise. It's all about why things are collected, I guess you could say to some extent. For for most, most of what I sell in the store that I share with you, it's stuff that people have a, a nostalgia with. They have a tie to, especially music. That's why I love the music aspect of it. The, the cards, the comics, every time I run into like a Batman issue, a 12 center or a 10 cent issue of Batman comics, I, it brings me back to being a child and going to a comic book show or the mall shows or any of this stuff, buying movie posters, buying a lot of 100 movie posters. I, I remember putting those movie posters into a frame at the movie theater I worked with. So for me, it, it's more... It's, it means more to me selling what I sell than it probably does to a lot of people because to me, it's more than just a collectible. And I'm being serious. I 100%, this is literally what I think. To me, it brings back fond memories of uh, days gone by, I guess. And I'm not trying to be all, you know, squishy feeling or anything like that. But for me, that's literally what some of this stuff means. And the people that buy it from me think the same way. So that's why I would do this and and why I've steered into doing these areas. And Dom loves what he does with the comics and all that stuff. I, I'm, I don't even have to ask him because look at the wall behind him. That's <laughs> all you got to do. So for if Dom wasn't selling on here, his room would probably still look like that. He'd still probably have a comic book room in his house or a display area. Totally. That's, that's, that's the demographics of the people that buy these sorts of things. And it's huge. It's broad. It covers, Every spectrum of a collectible field that you can think of, whether it's a first edition Stephen King book from 1979, whether it's a frame puzzle of the Pink Panther from, you know, 72 that was put out by, you know, some well-known company, play school or something. All of this stuff is why I do this and, and steer towards it. 
we didn't even know we were going to be our main feature in the story share with you, that this was going to make that much money. And it wasn't the money. Again, that's that's the point that a lot of people miss. I love the stuff. I, I, I love it. I bought it before I sold it. I love what I do with it. I don't want to miss this because my feed's terrible. But thank you, Karen. I do believe that is Karen. It looks like I see your... Yeah, thank you, Karen Henderson. Again, you, you guys don't have to do that. I really honestly appreciate that. I've had memberships available for months on end here. I haven't even put one together because I don't know. I don't want to just collect money for stuff. I do appreciate all this. I I, 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 I feel it down inside. I'm, again, I'm not trying to be all squishy and, you know, be emotional about this, but I, it, it, it means a lot coming from a person like me for people to do that. And again, thank you all, Karen and, and Carol and Carl. And, and um, uh, I think your name I'm has to start with Chris. a hard C to be doing the super chats tonight because we <laughs> Carol, Carl, and Karen. Any any other hard C's in the house here? Let's see. I scroll through here. <laughs> Is there hard a cast C, around okay. or I don't know? Let's see if we can find anyone else here. It's hard. C. Somebody mentioned somebody mentioned the creepy crawler commercial. I got a ding on that commercial, mind you. It's a public domain commercial. The Orchard Music. Look them up. They are trying to claim they've got a group call called Creepy Crawlers, and they're trying to claim that video, the whole video of mine, as being you know owned by them because of a 1965 public domain commercial for Creepy Crawlers. I had to spend an hour dealing with that. Still haven't heard a, a response back on that at all. But uh, just FYI, I see somebody mentioning the Creepy Crawlers on there. That was that was troublesome to spend all that time. And put it up and then instantly get a ding on it. You know, when you you liked the commercial, you sourced it from Duke University's public domain section. I mean, come on. But anyway, a little bit of a rant there. Sorry, folks. No, but you know, it, it's just some of the stuff that if you're not, if you don't run a YouTube channel, you don't understand some of the pain in the next stuff that we have to deal with behind the scenes. You know, like I was telling you before the show started of uh, some company flagging my outro that I've had for almost a year trying to put a copyright claim on it, even though I have the license to the outro. And it took like me talking to this company, make a long story short, like after four or five flags and me having to dispute the takedowns with them for them to finally whitelist my, um, my channel so that they stopped flagging the outro that I had the license to, but just these things take a, a lot of time up on the side. And so, um, you no, know, it's nice to see you get the support, Don. You do, you do deserve it, like everyone in the chat said. Well, I, I honestly and I sincerely appreciate it all. Um, it, it's it's just annoying when you spend that video. I think it's like twelve or fourteen minutes long. I shot forty-seven minutes of video for that. Forty-seven minutes of me talking and and stuff, not counting the commercial or any of that stuff. And it, I spent. Since I don't have anybody editing, I'm editing some of them now myself. Somebody's doing some listings. But the, the point of it is I spent like two hours editing that thing down to where it's at now. And you get it up. You're all excited. You, you're, you're into the items. I had creepy crawlers as a kid. So for me, again, nostalgia. That meant that that commercial means something to me. I wanted to put a newer one in, but I didn't want to pull one that's not public domain. So it was it, it's upsetting when something you put time and effort into and that you you honestly sincerely like creepy crawlers. I've got some of the trays here right now and, and to get dinged over a brand new group that wasn't even founded until like six years ago, trying to claim something from 65 from a public domain internet archives was just crazy. Is that one of the talking ones? No, it's a uh, friendly neighborhood. Spider-Man is uh just checking out what's going on here. He heard he heard the word comic book, so uh, he he wanted to pop on by and see what's going on. His spider uh, sense. I had one of those that was a walkie-talkie. No, no, and his, a radio. His spider senses were tingling, so he just wanted to check out what was going on. <laughs> That's another thing of of thinking about nostalgia. When I was a kid, and even in school, we watched The Electric Company, and Spider Man oh, oh, had a live action, and and I have fond memories of. I mean, I was in what maybe third grade or something like that, you know, but I remember Spider-Man. I remember the song. I could probably sing the entire song right now from the electric company, Spider-Man thing or the, Love the 1960s 
Mar same same here. The Marvel's 1960s Spider-Man. I, I know the words to that as, as well, too, because that was one of the ones I always liked. I liked the, the cornball 1960s, like Johnny Quest. To me, Johnny Quest was like an iconic... I know they did hold frames and stuff like that too. It was cheap cell animation, you know, very poorly done, but it it it's nostalgic. The stories were good, they were well written, the music went with it. Kind of is reminiscent of or Archer's kind of reminiscent of that. The original first uh, six seasons of Archer. After that, they kind of went haywire. But you know, the nostalgia is what sells, and that's where I I excel in, and I've learned enough to to realize why it sells. I took college things related to cultural studies and. You know, that's where I want to be, whether there was money in it or not. Like Dom's comic book store, Mile High Comics. He did it whether he was making a fortune or not because he liked it. So I like what I do. I like this. And people say, you know, we well, won't like it this time or that time. I don't care. I like what I sell. I like the conversations. I like the the interactions with people who do stuff with it. I always, when somebody buys mass quantities of cards or paper items, I always talk to them. I want to know. And a lot of people run businesses and they'll create. It's always interesting to find, you know, what people do with the stuff and not just collectors. Because I sell to a lot of businesses and stuff, even art companies and stuff buy from us. And it, it's, it's all always comes back around to nostalgia, um, reminiscent um, vintage items and, and collectibles in this era and that era. I mean, that's that's where going forward, that this these areas are still going to be there. When this is all said and done, even if shirts aren't selling very well or, or video games drop back down or puzzles don't sell as well, nostalgia will still sell. There won't be a, a lack of people wanting nostalgia. Everybody at some point is reminiscent of their childhood. You get older, whatever the case may be. You want that stuff back, you know? You know, if I if I was rich beyond wildest dreams, I'd probably start to buy all the Star Wars figures from 77. I'd buy the Tron figures, you know, mint in the box, every one of them. You know, I'd have to have space because we've got a room of just weebles these days, you know, just massive amounts of weebles and stuff. Oh, weeble video is coming out um, really, really soon here. I've got in the beginning, it's it's kind of be kind of throw some people off. But the, the beginning of it is a origin short film of the weebles just fyi it's going to be i've got voices and all kinds of stuff going to be in it um it's going to be a takeoff of nostalgia so um i i that came up while we were sitting here and i want to do that before i put the videos out there it's going to be like three videos to start with all done all edited i just wanted an origin story for the weebles you'll see it when it comes out but uh, anyway uh i just thought i saw people it. like sorry. your People like your electric company nostalgia. Then. I liked I liked that. I I liked I it. it. It was sad when, when I did too, and it was sad when PBS, you know, no longer controls Sesame Street. Sesame Street is now a, a paid for profit yeah. company, basically, and that really yeah. bothered me because I enjoyed the fact that PBS was their public broadcast system it was there to help with with that. Big Bird to me was was a, a way to learn stuff just like um schoolhouse rock again another nostalgia one the only part about schoolhouse rock that i that always bothered me was michael eisner was involved with schoolhouse rock and having met the guy and he was just rude and obnoxious i, I just it killed it for me to some extent but i learned the preamble of the declaration of independence from schoolhouse rock i can still sing it from start to finish, the whole thing from Schoolhouse Rock. I know how a bill becomes a law because of Schoolhouse Rock. You know, conjunction, junction, what's your function, adjectives. I mean, all that stuff is nostalgia. All that stuff had a, an important meaning to a child back then when I was a kid. I waited for the commercials praying that, you know, um, uh, like a good uh, Schoolhouse Rock came on. You know, it, the, the nostalgia is what, what, thrills me and what i get into like i'm sure when dom goes out and he sees a vintage comic book that he had as a child you know he may be prone maybe not to sell it right away and go back and read it again you know so all yeah. that means something that if, if you want something that's always going to be collectible or always going to be bought collectibles i mean nostalgia items it, it, nostalgia items can be um uh, new jack swing clothing or something you know something like that something from the 90s something it doesn't necessarily just have to be collectible collectibles. Clothing has nostalgia to it. Somebody had a concert shirt from uh, 80s Aerosmith concert. They won. Yeah. If you saw our house, you'd think it was. 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, it, it definitely makes you, I think, um, a better reseller. It makes it easier to find items out there. Um, you know, when you're going through a, a, a place that has a bunch of vintage stuff to be able to recognize things, that doesn't mean you can't learn it, but you know, if you did grow up with that type of stuff, you, you do have a greater and deeper appreciation of it. Um, the other thing that's good about it, especially if you used to collect that type of stuff is that, you know, the importance of, you know, packing it properly and, 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 you know, and shipping it, uh, properly protecting it properly so that it doesn't arrive damaged. That's that sort of stuff. Um, you know, as opposed to someone who, who didn't collect these types of things and just kind of threw it in a bag, didn't protect it. Um, you know, it, it does give you a better uh, appreciation. I always kind of laugh when somebody, you know, purchases something and they send me a message and they tell me exactly how to pack it and everything like that. I'm like, well, you know, they don't know. And I understand they've had bad experiences before, but then I tell them like, well, don't worry about it. It's going to get there just fine. Trust me. If you tell people you're a collector and a seller, it, it puts them at ease a bit. They, they, yeah, I get ones for selling. I sell 78s all the time. Maybe one out of five of every single 78 I sell, unless they bought from me before, they always have a big description that they've have saved. They've typed up yeah. this huge, long yeah. four paragraph thing. Right. And it's all kinds of people do this and it, every time. And I say, no worries. I've sold 10 or 20,000 78s right. through the mail in just the last five years. <laughs> I, I hear that all the time on, on stuff like that. I got one today, though, that, that set me off. Not set me off, but he complained that I wrapped it too well. I, he said overkill. And it was because I put a piece of tape at the end of a postcard sleeve so that it couldn't get moisture in it. Yeah. And that was such a huge right. ordeal to this right. one guy out of sending 50,000 <laughs> items. He right. said, your, your answer is no good. I don't accept it. It's, uh, he went on and on about how bad <laughs> it was for me to steal it from, from water. And, and it was just crazy. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, all he had to do, he said he had to get a razor blade out to cut it. And I'm like, dude, there is, there's like, a, I put like half a centimeter so you can just cut it along the edge and it falls right out. You can use it. I don't know what, I, I, I don't think I should have to put instructions, but he wouldn't let it go. And I think I'll get a negative feedback from that. If, if at least a neutral saying I overkilled the package because I sealed it from moisture. This I, I just recent? don't get it. It's still winter today. Yeah today yeah oh, i was so yeah. frustrated i'm like did i he went back and forth and i i put a a nice you know response i never once said anything nasty and i said look i i didn't say look like that but i said you know my my goal is to protect the items i like what i sell i went on and on i, I said you know i protect them i don't want water getting in them i said i've done this the same way for so many you know i'm talking fifty thousand items or more i've sent just cards like that in the last few years so it's not like this isn't a proven method. I've done it the same way. I'm not changing it for this one guy. I did block him, which I, I just because I'm afraid at some point he's going to buy again, knowing and then give me all TO'd and make another comment or make a comment. I'm very prone not to block somebody, but when, when they're that much of asinine attack on me over, so all I did was put a piece of tape to close it. So there's no, so the flaps close. That's all I did. I, it just, it just dumbfounded me why someone would think that's such an issue. But, you know, I, 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 I'm never surprised, I guess, other than when it's packed well and they complain it's packed too well. I don't think that's overkill. A no. piece of tape. We're, we're, yeah. we're talking. Like, no, true. Like if I had a box like, like this, um, you know, if you taped across, like a lot of people, you know, tape across here, but this part on the side, a lot of people leave this part open. And what happened, this is the spot where moisture can go, go into. I if, tape uh, it all up. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I, I put it. Every edge. There is not an open flap That's or an it. open edge on anything I mail out. Exactly. Exactly. And 99.9% um, .9 of your customers are going to appreciate that. Like Don said, you might get one who's, who says something like too much tape or something like that. But it, trust me, uh, just like Carol said in the chat, she'd rather have uh, overkill, which I don't even think it's overkill, but uh, rather have overkill than uh, terrible packaging because you're going to get way more problems with the uh, shoddy packaging than you're going to get uh, protecting it properly like that. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I mean, it, it's just I try. I treat. Every item, I, I sometimes somebody will buy something from me that's like four or five bucks, and they'll make a big, 
you know, paragraphs saying how important it is to them. And, and, you know, please take care of it. I take care of every item. Like it's a thousand dollar item. Everything that goes out the door has tracking. Everything has cardboard. Every single thing I ship has plastic sealed on every edge. So nothing can penetrate the, the item, everything. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a, I don't sell anything for 50 cents, but if it was 50 cent item, it's going to be packed up like it's it's gold, like you want to take care of it. You should treat everything that way because even if it's a $5 item to you that you got nothing into, to somebody else, that may have belonged or that may be something that their their father who's passed away since cherished and they want this item. It may be something that was part of their family at one time or their father owned it or their grandfather. I saw a lot of stuff to people just because of the last name on the item that I sell, paper items especially. Postcards, I sell postcards to people whose great grandfather owned that building or owned that business or did this or did that. I treat everything and you should treat every single thing you ship like it's some cherished relic that can no way be replaced. That's how I take it. And what I express to the customer, I was like, you know, I I, I, I never once degraded his, his thoughts on it. But to me, thinking in my head, that's crazy. I mean, somebody, I saw somebody make a comment that maybe he destroyed it getting it out. If he destroyed this, he didn't say he did, but if he did destroy it getting out, I mean, there's a big gap. I always keep a gap on, on at least one side of everything I send out so you can just take a pair of scissors. I mean, maybe he didn't think about it, but, but the point is everything should be treated as if it's it's some cherished relic, you know, a thousand year old piece of glass. Everything should be treated that way. Yeah, I think it shows respect for what you're selling. It shows respect for your your buyers that you you treat everything like it's it's important to them. And most of what I sell is vintage and it's something somebody doesn't need. They're buying it for a reason. They're buying because they want it. They're buying it because it does something for them. And I treat it that way. I guess that's that's my think on that. Yeah. Yeah. And also it's a great way to get return customers because if that customer regularly likes to buy something, like we just bring the example of comic books and they've had bad experiences in the past, or like you said, records, um, you know, I had a lot of times when I was buying comics that I was frustrated with the way things were getting delivered through, uh, you know, through eBay and the way they were packaged and stuff. And when I, I know when I found somebody who I thought was, was good and they, they packed things properly, I tended to go back to that person as a repeat customer. So uh, like Bill said in the chat, your packaging is your reputation when you ship. So treat it uh, accordingly. So you only get that one chance, like they say, to make that first impression. So uh, make sure. Definitely. So, yeah. So James so made a comment about, I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. I was just going to say, James made a comment about not using recycled boxes. I don't, as a 99% of what I ship does not go in a recycled box. I, I get a new box. And one reason, I know I could dumpster dive and all that stuff. And I don't, I, I'm not prone not to do that. I don't have any problem doing that. I wouldn't want to do it only because one of my best friends is like second in command of the sheriff's department who's over my area. I don't want any issues with anybody like that. But, um, I send out so many of the same similar items. It's just easier to buy a, a skid or a flat of boxes, you know, for, you know, almost nothing. And I cut my boxes up. So I get the sizes that I want. So I don't usually use recycled. Again, I don't care what you use. It's an appearance factor to some extent for us. Just like if I buy boxes that have printing on the boxes, if I'm cutting them down, even if I'm putting the cardboard inside of a poly bag at the end, I always put all the advertisement turned in. So when they first see a package, the only thing on the outside is what I want on the outside. I use the plain clear side of the boxes. So like if Walmart, for example, I used to use their 14 cubes, 14, 14 by 14 cubes. And I cut them up and turn them all inside out per panel. So if I'm shipping out like a comic book, it goes in, in a 12 by 12 by 12 panel. So I cut down a box into four pieces. And always, I, I do it the same way. Big do not bend. Do not bend on both sides. I've got stars on each corner. And then their label goes on there. So they know. I've got people that say, I knew your package was there as soon as I saw the mail lady coming up because it stands out. You know, if it's something that they order from me a lot, like records. The one guy the one guy who sent the a big, long spiel about packing safely sent me a thank you letter. I mean, a real nice one. And he's been back. God, I don't know. He's probably bought 50 78s for me, just him in the, probably the last six months. And I'm not exaggerating. One time he bought like 12, only because he knew I packed them well. I mean, I'm telling you, the packing can mean a big difference, especially when you've got a 
a high-end record collector or something that that's gung-ho on these records and a 78 if you break it you may not find another copy of that in 10 20 years so you treat everything that way i guess is the point right no totally agree totally agree there's somebody else I, my feed's terrible, so me trying to read the comments and questions uh, almost no, People are just talking about uh, the percentage that they use used boxes versus new boxes. Uh, Midwest Picker was saying he's about 50-50. Uh, same with me. Uh, I'm real careful with the recycle boxes, though. So, you know, you have to have – if you're going to use them, you have to have standards for that. You have to make sure that they're not, you know, totally worn down, that they're still in good condition, they're still in good shape, um, you know even if they're not viable maybe to ship out sometimes they are good enough for fill for um you know to you know do some sort of protection maybe you could even cut like a little piece out of it and use for uh, protecting postcards or something like that so i try to uh, use things as much as as possible it does save you on um you know on external costs so um you know like i said uh, about 50 50 like midwest picker says i mean i have a lot behind me of of stuff that I wound up getting through um, through eBay uh, through my store voucher, so I make sure that I use that every quarter. That's a good reason, one re benefit of having a store. For those of you who haven't done that yet, you will get a, a voucher every quarter that you could use to uh, redeem it for sh uh, shipping supplies. So you get things like envelopes and um, boxes, poly bags, tape, poly bags. Yeah, so I have a lot of that stuff. I pretty much have every single size uh, in stock. You could order them and. Um, lots of uh, 25 or 50 typically uh so I have a lot of that stuff and um you know they're, they're good boxes so yeah they're not bad they cut off all the big sizes i'm sure over shipping i only get poly bags from ebay these days i use all my 125 bucks for one store with poly bags and the other one i think i got last time um yeah i got poly bags i got six by nines with the one store and the other store i got the nine by twelves that's what i used all of my my hundred 200 and what was it? 200 was it 250 bucks worth of poly or no 300. I'm sorry. I think it's 150 bucks. We get a month or uh, every three months, 50 bucks a month, basically. Somebody else was talking about priority. I almost, I have priority boxes up here, but I ship most of my items first class because I bill, I charge everybody for shipping. If it's included, you know, use priority, whatever you want, but I charge for shipping. So I do try to keep it at a reasonable rate. I use anything under 16 ounces just goes first class. I use the cardboard that I buy. And like if I'm cutting up a box, I get my boxes for like, for like, um, geez, what are they now? I think they're 62 cents. If I buy a skid or half a skid, which is uh, five, half a skid's a um, four foot tall stack on a pallet, basically, of, of the same size boxes. I can get them for like a 40 cents or I cut them up for me if I mail out a comic book. I can mail out a comic book for ten cents. Um, my cost for the shipping, and that covered in my my shipping cost because I charge them for shipping. I do not give out the discount, and the discount covers my percent I pay for final value fee on the shipping, and it covers my shipping costs too. So my shipping is a wash basically. I don't I don't make a dime. I don't have anything to concern about that at all so that's just my take on it i do use new boxes because of that if i'm going to charge shipping i pretty much have to use good shipping supplies i don't want somebody coming back you charge me for shipping and then you use some old dingy box or you use cardboard that you've used a few times i i, I don't do that um especially for a lot of the vintage items because again it's going to like a college or a professor or, or a company or something and i want the best example if you're buying from a, a national company or something and they're going to send you a box that's been used and all beat up and has other labels and markouts on it and stuff, it doesn't look good in my opinion. I know we're not a big company. I know most people are just a one-off person, but you want to portray yourself as a professional national company, at least portray yourself that way. Your writings, your, your form, everything you do projecting out from company forms, emails, everything should be done as if you are, you know, uh, a part of a million dollar company. That's my take on it. Appearances mean a lot. You know, that look, that feel of somebody who, who's got it down to a T I, we send everything the same way. Every every package I set that's paper or books or anything, exactly the same way. Every single one of them wrapped the same way, sealed the same way, labeled the same way. Every single item I ship out, you know. Yeah, uh, Dave uh, Midwest Picker, uh, he said 
Dom shit my magazine like it was the Mona Lisa. LOL, loved it. And that was a that was a nine dollar ninety nine cent Terminator Two magazine. I, I remember that. And uh, yeah, I I would treat that item just like I'll treat you know an item that would sell for for much more money. You know, it doesn't matter. And one of the things I just mentioned it since Carol said she had, hadn't thought of it was um, with posters. And I've shown these before. Uh, these poster tubes. This is an example of a of a of a longer one here. This is a uh, 36 inch uh, poster tube. Is that one of the things you have to remember is that when you put the caps uh, at, on your poster tube and then you've got the poster inside of it, okay, you have to remember that this thing is gonna move around a bit when it is, uh, when, when it's in transit. And so when you go like this before you tape up the ends, by the way, I do suggest taping your ends off so that someone can't just pull it off and take your poster out. You don't want that to happen along the way. Uh, so still, even though these pop in here, put tape around it like this, tape around it the other way, and then tape around the end like that to keep it secure. That's the best thing to do. Um, trust me, it's real tricky to pull the tape off when you when you do it like that. A anyway, um, when you, you move it around like this, you're gonna hear it's gonna start shaking around inside and that's gonna be a problem because when the person gets it, by the time it gets there, this thing's going to have moved around on so many different conveyor belts and so many different places that it's going to keep smashing along the edge of it the entire time. And the person's going to get a poster that has all sorts of indentations, creases at the ends, and even maybe even some little tears happen along the way. So what you want to do is what they call put padded ends on them. You could use anything you want. It could be something as basic as, and I'll just grab a paper towel because that's just what i have near me but i use bubble wrap but pretend this was just bubble wrap you know you just pack it up like this and you just put it right at the end like this and then you put one on the other end as well and so you've got padded ends and then you just go like that and then just do a little test and you should not hear any movement whatsoever when that happens you know you're all set and uh it's a great uh tip for shipping out posters so that they don't uh so that they don't get damaged yeah, I used uh, I usually get those types from the um, uh, carpet companies and the fabric stores. I can get free tubes, but if you don't have those tubes, I make triangle boxes. I'll just make a triangle yep. and put them in there too. And they're usually crush proof as well when you do that. So if you don't have the money or you don't want to go out and mess with the with the tubes, tubes are great because they save you time. Um, again, depends on how much you pay for them. But you can make your own of those too. I I've been able to make any box pretty much I need. Again, I'd rather just have a tube and save my time. Truthfully, don't have the tubes to try just fine. I think I may even have one of those in one of my videos. Me and Dom both have packing videos, so if you want to know how to pack anything, either one of us probably have a big list on all of that. Give you a bigger perspective on how big the thirty-six inch one is. So, hey, Dom, and you can cut those down too. Don, can you hear my? Does my voice sound different this way, Don? <laughs> Maybe I should Not do a little video like this one day. <laughs> special, special voice. You could do a Dalek voice through this; it would sound pretty cool. Well, that you might be able to do. Yeah, well, let me try uh, that. Well, well, Exterminate the doctor. <laughs> so you could do that. They actually have a video um, in England. If you don't watch Doctor Who, the Daleks are um, the the doctor's biggest enemy. They're these metal pepper pot looking uh, machines, and they're you know they were actually um, basically patterned after uh, after the Nazis. Um, and so uh, you know just based on their whole attitude, and they're just like these evil uh, this evil race from the planet Scaro. And um, they actually have the, they're a cultural icon in, in England. They actually have them patrolling the streets now, Don, in England. They have Daleks patrolling the streets, telling people that they have to stay inside. They're quarantined under the order of the Daleks, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Did, did, did you watch season 12? Uh, season 12, I pro uh, of the current the last season. You mean of Doctor Who? Yeah. Um, I probably did. I've, I, um, I, I started to get turned off actually by the newer series, uh, towards the end of after seven or eight, huh? After season seven or eight of the newer series. No, it was yeah. more, more around like the late, the us like more around like season 11. I start, yeah. Oh, don't watch this season. Don't watch this season then at all because they totally changed the whole canon of the whole show. And yeah. they just destroyed everything yeah. prior to this season right. of the whole series. Yeah. I, I can never watch any of the new ones. Right. That, that, right. Um, so when I say I'm Dr. Van, I'm really more what we call classic who. Vinted. 
Yeah, vintage Doctor Who. So from 1963 to 1989, I have every single um, episode on both VHS and on DVD. So uh, plus the ones that they re-released on Blu-ray. So I'm like, I love that show. So definitely my favorite. In, 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 in the 70s, there was a movie called the shape of things to come. I think it's an, uh, um, an Orwell or something movie, but they use Delex in there and they weren't supposed to be Delex. If I remember right, you know, which one I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure it's the shape of things to come. I think the show. No, the I, was I, I, not, no I didn't see that. And what's that? Dr. Who and the Delex is there's a song called that too. You know yeah, what I'm talking there, about? There was, yeah, there was, they did do a song. It's a, it's a, it's a rock and roll song too. I think from like yep. 70, Three or so. I like the song. Yeah, it's got a catchy beat. Tom Baker. Yeah, he's my favorite. Yeah, mine, mine as well. I, I was going to say most. People... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, he's still alive, Tom Baker. Oh no, I, I he, he was just always my favorite though. He was the yeah. one I grew up watching. I mean, he's the only reason I ever watched the show to start off with was because of him. He played the part very well. He did, and and when they first started to put Doctor Who on in the United States. They started it when Tom Baker was the doctor. So that's why everyone our age, when we grew up with that, um, you know, we grew up with him as our doctor. And I don't know about you, Dom, but when I first, I remember the first time I ever saw a black and white Doctor Who, I was completely and utterly fascinated by it. And I, I was like obsessed with watching those because all I knew was, you know, from Tom Baker on. And then they started to get those in in the U.S. over from England and started playing them, and it just it just blew those episodes just blew my mind. I love them. Well, when I was when I was a kid, we used to be able. To, it, it showed up in Canada before it was here by like two or three years, so we could pick up nine out of Windsor in Canada and watch BBC One and BBC Two. So I got to watch a lot of the British shows. Back when I was a kid, my my parents had this huge monster antenna, and we were real close to to Canada. 35 minute drive and I could be in Canada probably. But the, the point of it was that I got to watch all those shows and that's what I liked. I watched every Monty Python, all six seasons of that. I watched, are you being sir? I mean, there were so many of those British faulty towers and the British shows that I just love because there wasn't much U S broadcast around here. We got like three other channels, uh, one ABC, one NBC, and then CBS. And then, uh, 30 PBS Toledo, I think. And then, uh, we got Windsor, Channel 9 out of Windsor. And then if the weather's right, we could pick up another Canadian channel. But BBC One and BBC Two were the bomb back when I was a kid. They used to play like Ultraman before they played it here and all that stuff. And I was a huge Ultraman fan when I was like seven and eight. I, everything was Ultraman and Shogun Warriors and the Micronauts. And Takara was like the bomb for companies. And um, what, what's the other one? Uh, geez, there was just so many of those those shows that I got to watch from, from Canada, um, just being so close to it. So I, I'm a big fan of a lot of the British shows. Monty Python, I loved as a kid. I think I've seen every episode. I don't know how many times I could repeat and probably sing some of the songs. I mean, from word for word, you know, like the Lumberjack song. That was one of the ones everybody used to make the most fun of or the argument sketch or the dead parrot or any of that stuff. For anybody who watches the British shows. And Benny Hill. Benny Carl Hill. Benny Hill. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the first time I saw Benny Hill was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He plays a toy maker in there in that. And, and I never knew who he was. And then my father, when I was a little older, had um, the Benny Hill show on. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the toy maker. That's all I knew him as, the toy maker from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And on a side note, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a Ian Fleming book, if you know who Ian Fleming is. Yep, um, yep. Somebody will shout that out. That's another one of those know your stuff kind of things, knowing that uh, Ian Fleming did that and the same person produced. Well, I won't call that. Somebody will probably say who that is. Bond. <laughs> yeah, Benny Hill looks like quite a few Benny Hill people there. Yeah. No, I'm not, not going to sing tonight, Carol. Yeah, Bill, I was in the Bill choir hit, too. Bill at hit the 007. Yeah, somebody. I knew somebody would get it. Um, I was on the choir at Regina Chaley uh, as a Catholic grade school that I went to, uh, and I was on the choir for five years. So somewhere there is video of me singing in choir quite a few times, or singing as a altar boy in in church as well. I was an altar boy for Ca Carol. Geez, said, I think I. Right. Carol said she feels like you're dying to sing tonight. 
No, 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 definitely no. not. Don't sing anymore no. at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't sing at all. Not a big singer. My rhythm, my rhythm's gone these days, unless it's like 90s um alternative or something, or 80s hair metal or something. Oh, I, I do like New Jack Swing. I have to say I've always liked New Jack Swing. If if I'm sure somebody will know what New Jack Swing is, but Bobby Brown, my prerogative, um Montel Jordan, I love all that kind of stuff too, because a lot of the people I hung out with did the dance. I love break dancing too, at least watching it. Going back to nostalgia. Everything goes back to nostalgia. You know, everybody's reminiscing about stuff. But anyway, yeah. her name. Did I miss something here? No, I don't think so. Somebody with a ton of uh, DVDs, British. Uh, British stuff. There's quite a, a bit of good British stuff, I have to say. Of course, I liked, you know, I watched every episode of Space. I watched Get Smart, F Troop. Uh, geez, I mean, there's just so many shows back in the day that meant a lot to back then. I, I liked Hogan's Heroes, and my parents were big MASH fans. Um, you know, Jamie Farr, my dad grew up near Jamie Farr. It had something to do with it. They hung out together. Jamie Farr is from where we live here. But but the funny thing about no, this I don't is to, break bring it, to, to bring it back to reselling for a second is that all these things that we're sitting here talking about nostalgic for and everyone in the chat is chiming in and writing you know, things they're nostalgic for as well or saying, oh, yeah, 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 I love that, I love that. That reaction, that emotion is what drives those sales when we come across items like that, you know, when we find them out there, that's why we pick them up because we know there's going to be someone out there that's going to pay up for it, that's going to like it, it's going to enjoy it. Nostalgia. Yeah. Jennifer's making a comment on, on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang here, and I, I have to call it out too. One of the creepiest scenes I had seen as a kid was the 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 king's um child i guess um nap or whatever they did they'd come around and cage up all the kids and the guy who played the the evil child catcher was just phenomenal at that i think he was like a a ballet star or something if i'm not mistaken but that is one of the creepiest scenes i, I can remember was them caging up a child in a cart and taking him to a dungeon as a child, I guess that movie reminded me a lot of what's, you know, nostalgia in general, just because again, I saw that as a kid talking about Benny Hill and I never knew who Benny Hill was until later on in my, you know, when I got a little older, um, you know, Benny Hill had been around for 30 years or more. So probably at that point he was a, um, I think he had a talk show even when he was like in his twenties on BBC one, if I'm not mistaken, $6 yeah. million man. Yeah. I, I, I literally have a, a commercial I wanted to add at the end of one, but it's got part of the music. I love the $6 million man. I had the full size $6 million man. I had his repair tube station in his engine. I had the, the bionic arm one that had the special features in his arm. I love the fact that you could roll up the skin on his arms and stuff and put in new little circuitries. I had um, Oscar Goldman. And I had, I think it's Maskatron, I think is the evil guy in there too. I never had the Fembot. Austin Powers stole fembots from the six million dollar man's bionic woman line. Just FYI, if you didn't know that, because a fembot is from the original bionic woman, Jamie Summers. Um, just FYI, yeah, and yeah, you know, I liked sorry, I loved Wonder Woman, I loved the, the credits, I love the animate or the cartoon credits in the front of Wonder Woman. Me and the wife will sometimes watch just the intros because the bionic man, six million dollar man, had an awesome intro. So did the Wonder Woman. I mean, a lot of those shows, the, the music, the intro music was just awesome in my book. You know, and I guess that's part of the nostalgia about the whole thing. If you ever find, and I've found it before, the complete uh, DVD set for uh, the Wonder Woman, instant guaranteed seller. Uh, I, um, I found it before and uh, sold within 24 hours. And it sells for something like 60 bucks or something like that. It was a great... Uh, a great pickup, but um, Bill mentioned something that's important, which is that he said, because you know, we're talking about nostalgia for for us and our experiences with it, and we tend to think of that as well, you know, it throws me back to when I was a kid and I watched that show or I read that book or I saw that movie. But Bill also mentioned that watching, for example, Hogan's Heroes he gets a memory of doing that with his father. And so when people will sometimes purchase nostalgic items 
to have that memory of doing something fun with a relative who sometimes may not be around anymore. And it's a way to try to reconnect with that person to kind of just re-experience it, almost kind of traveling back in time a bit. So uh, that's another reason, by the way, that emotion, that that connectivity to somebody else is why someone will be willing to pay up for it. Um, you know, I'll give you a very, see, very, very basic example. Um, I had found, um, you know, as I was good, just going through some stuff that I had uh, around here and I had come across a, a poster that I had picked up at in a, a state sale a while back. It was of uh, premier cruise lines, uh, that had the big red boat on it that used to take people uh, to Disney world, uh, from 1985 to 1993, they used to do that. And so, um, this particular poster with this particular boat on it, there was no other one out there uh, that was uh, that was like it. I had it listed for uh, twenty four ninety nine because it had a significant degree of damage to it. There was a lot of rips on it, a lot of tears. Uh, there was tape on the back, stains, that type of stuff. But the main part of the poster that showed the boat, that part of it was intact. It was more the the fringes of it, the edges of it that had that damage to it, but still takes down the value. Anyway, I put up yesterday, a guy offered me $15 for it. Um, so I countered him at $19.99 and then he um, countered me at $17 and I just declined it because I knew in my mind that this guy, this is the type of guy, you have to know who it is you're targeting when you're listing these things. And I know you have to think who's going to buy this. The person who's going to buy this is the person who was on that ship with their family. And why are they bidding on it? Because they want it. They want to hang it somewhere for those memories. So sure enough, an hour goes by and he sends me an offer for $18. And of course, Mrs. Primetime, my wife and the kids are all saying, take it, 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 take it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Go, trust me on this. So I wrote him back again. I said, 1999 is halfway. It's more than fair. And, um, you know, they're like, no, no. And we've gone through the same routine 10,000 times. They never learn. And so sure enough, within like, I don't know, 10 seconds later, you hear the cha-ching go off. And I'm like, I told you, I'm like, you just got to think through the psychology of it. You know, I just put it up yesterday. Uh, I'm not worried about it. You know, I'll give the guy, I'm willing to give the guy a little bit of a deal, but it's more than fair. And I knew that he really wanted it, especially when he came back from that 7, 18, you pretty much know they're going to, they're, they're going to go uh, that halfway. So don't feel scared about that. If you have a nostalgic item like that, all the stuff that Don and I are talking about and everyone in the chat's talking about uh, tonight. That's why people will, uh, they will pay up for it. So use that knowledge when you're negotiating. That's good negotiating psychology. Definitely. I do that all the time. If, if they don't take an offer and I counter back and they just counter back with the same offer, I just decline it. I don't know how many times they come back and make that offer that I originally had for them and they'll take that offer. <laughs> I, I don't even worry anymore. I'm not going to give it away just to get let them have it for a cheaper price. Yeah. As somebody else has called out Hawaii Five O. Love the intro to Hawaii Five O. I have the soundtrack from that here right now. I just listened to that maybe two or three days ago, and I think somebody else made another comment here. Walking Dead was great up until season seven. I stopped watching it at season seven. Very disappointed with the way they took it, but you know, life goes on. There was somebody else had another. Oh, Tracy Allman, Gail May uh, Mac. Maca Macar, hopefully I pronounced that right. Tracy Ullman show is famous for one thing besides Tracy Ullman. It's an animated TV show that's the longest running TV show on, I think, in history, which is The Simpsons. The very first Simpsons cartoon was on the Tracy Ullman show, if you didn't know that. Look it up. That's that's like one of those nostalgia things. But all these shows, Fantasy Island, uh, that used to come on at 10. It was Love Boat and then Fantasy Island after yep. that. I do remember that. They were one after each other, too. The plane. The little plane. guy after that. Yeah, the plane, yeah. Um, Ricardo Montalban, I always loved him as Khan from Star Trek to The Wrath of Khan. Yes, if you didn't awesome. know, he played Khan in the 1960s Star Trek series as well. So. That's right. And of course, I like the new Khan is actually was Doctor Who, which you should probably know as well in uh, Into Darkness, I think is the one with him in it. And uh, Cumberbund played the part extremely well. I can't believe people don't like the new Star Trek Obviously, they're all done with now, but love those. 
there's a bunch more people. I guess a lot of people like the nostalgia too, which is nice to see because I loved the shows that we're talking about. So, so Don, uh, I wish. Um, I, I guess it was good that in uh, my Instagram I put a picture of the TARDIS. I thought we were going to the future, but we we went both to the future and then we went back in time. So we went both ways on this show. I saw the TARDIS on there too. I wondered about that, but then I thought, oh yeah, I got you. <laughs> I had to think about that one for a minute there. All right. Yeah, good. somebody else is saying Love Boat and then Fantasy Island. Yep. I loved Breaking Bad. Now I do like Breaking Bad. That's I've seen great. every episode. Oh, yeah. Of Breaking Bad. yeah. I, I was just very disappointed with Walking Dead and, and stuff. When they killed uh, Glenn and stuff, that pretty much did it. And Abram, you know, I, I, I was done with them after that. I didn't care for the whispers. I, I wished I would have read the comic book because I probably wouldn't have started watching it had I seen where they took it. Just not my thing. I love zombie movies, don't get me wrong. Like 28 Days Later is a really good zombie movie. Walking Dead, the first seven seasons are good too. I liked when they were on the farm, truthfully. Always bugs me that people didn't like some of those episodes. I even like season one, except they they change how the zombies work from season one to season two. They it was just kind of bizarre. But anyway, yeah, they went down fast. I was surprised Walking Dead was still even on. I haven't even looked at it in so long. I don't even know what season they're on now. As I said, I turned it off on season seven when they did the big cliffhanger to see who was gonna die. I thought that was just terrible of them to do. <laughs> but anyway, that's just me. Trying to read some of the comments. My feed's like half in and half out. That page I was trying to load when the show started, Dom, is still trying to load. Oh, my God. Just, I know. It's still spinning the whole show. I, that's why I'm saying. There's always some some glitch on some end here that goes on with this. I don't know how much. I don't. I just realized we've been on for heading towards two hours. <laughs> I don't want to keep you on all night, Dom. Yeah. I don't know which way. I, I actually, with my job, it switched to uh, telehealth. So now I do my appointments with people just like this over the video. It's it I, I I do it here. I just have a curtain, a green curtain that kind of goes across so people can't, you know, see the back. But I, I have this feeling that I'm gonna get on one day, you know, with a patient or a patient's family member, and they're gonna say, hey, wait a minute, that's the prime time treasure hunter. <laughs> this would be this weird thing. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. But yeah, I've got uh, I've got one tomorrow at eight in the morning, so I do have to start getting ready for that and, and things like that. So yeah, I kind of lost track of the time we were just talking. So yeah, I've been trying to keep it to an hour, and we're like double that right now. So well, we I, I guess we should probably. Yeah, we went into the we nostalgia rabbit hole. This time. Well, I like the flashback. We got a lot of people talking about the old stuff too again that's what we sell i sell all this kind of stuff yeah. every every show i mentioned i bet you i've sold or had something from that show a collectible a lunchbox for sure you know lunchboxes every show i think we watch or we talked about had a lunchbox yeah. i had an emergency one lunchbox i had um uh what was it ludwig von duck lunchbox when i was a kid too from like 72 and it was um the math one where he where they uh, adventures in math i think is the disney animated short that, that came out of but anyway i think we should probably call it quits here we are running on the two hour time frame so i i always hate to do super super long ones and keep everybody on i honestly appreciate everybody for the super chats i mean it, it's sincerely i do feel you know touched uh, to some extent when people do that because it's not it's over and above what anybody needs to do so i do want to thank you all for doing that um you know it's never required in all honesty so anyway i'll let dom dom speak and i'll drop the last word because i got a few call outs for a few things i want to do before we head off yeah uh thanks everyone uh for coming by uh you know it's still kind of in the middle-ish slash endish of the week here uh, uh jump on board with us uh nice uh showing um had uh i don't know don i saw like to, like about 150 160 people on board watching so uh it's pretty good i can't tell from my end yeah yeah it's pretty good showing so uh appreciate it uh if you came in late make sure you go back to the beginning where don and i uh, really do spend a lot of time talking about where we think things are headed uh, in the future so we uh, threw a lot of ideas out there uh, for you things to think about uh things to consider um, and just, um, you know, like, uh, we've talked about, uh, just be willing to think outside the box, uh, think flexible, 
Um, as Don and I have both talked about before, things are constantly changing uh, from day to day, from week to week. You always have to, uh, you know, try to make sure you're staying on top of things and, and staying fresh to, you know, keep your business uh, uh, going and keep it uh, and keeping it successful. So uh, again, just thank everyone for coming by. And uh, if you haven't come by uh, to my channel, come on by Primetime Treasure Hunter. I'd love to see you over there. And uh, why don't you uh, pop your, why don't you pop another link at the bottom there? Um, yeah, I'll try to I find can't one. do it on my end. Yeah, I'll try to find one while you're talking. So thanks, Don. Thank you, Don, for coming on. Of course, I, I'll say this again. If you don't subscribe to Dom, you don't know who Dom is, you better go check his channel out and subscribe to Dom's channel. I'm not just saying that. I, I don't listen to much, but I always listen to Dom's videos. I, I, there's only been a couple times where I haven't had a chance to listen to one, but I always, always have him playing in the background. And usually when I'm packing up, Dom's one of the few. I mean, probably the only one I have probably could say I've seen like nearly every one of Dom's videos. And I think he's got 603, I think I saw uh, yesterday, somewhere in that range, probably uh, probably close to what we have here too. Um, just a few things, um, Patreon video will be up tomorrow. Um, our dog Jinx, the one you've seen with our white chihuahua had surgery yesterday. Um, and I literally spent the whole day with her and the, we were up to like six in the morning. She's fine, she had some masses removed but she's got a lot of stitches and she's been in pain. She was just crying all night. And literally before I came up here, I was laying on the sofa with her and she's got the cone on. And so I didn't do much these last two days. I was quarantined. This should have been done a couple of weeks ago. And so we finally got it done. So anyway, I, I haven't had a lot of time in the two days. I know it's a dog, but to me, she's part of my family. We call her the baby, you know? So um, for me, I've had her since she was, you know, just a few weeks old and, She's part of the family. So I did not do anything, which is very rare for me, pretty much, other than pack some stuff up. Um, so a video will be up tomorrow. It's the second part of that. I have started to put together um, some other videos, including a, um, in fact, I need to email somebody um, on that for a store review in Patreon. So for those in Patreon, it will be up. I do apologize. Things have been a little hectic. Uh, just want to express that I don't have any employees other than straight family. I've got kids that are working on college homework as well too. So it's not like they can do, you know, a ton of extra work as well. So it's been a little tough because I still do the same amount of stuff as I do without employees, but now I have no help. So just FYI, I'm working my way through everything. I will be on Patreon tomorrow. As I said, the Weebles video is something that I've spent a lot of time on. We've tried to get the best quality and there is going to be some fun and lightheartedness in the beginning. I have a origin story, as I said, for the Weebles, um, which is going to be very nostalgic. You're going to recognize uh, what it's trying to be for sure. Um, I'm stepping out from what I usually do. You'll get to see kind of the side of me and the wife that are more the goofy type. Um, I'm more a rigid person when it's talking about eBay, but Weebles, she has a room full of Weebles um, like you won't believe. Um, we just got another one in sealed we're pretty much only buying uh, NOS these days, Weebles, just FYI. But there's going to be some animated Weebles and all kinds of stuff in there, too. I spent a lot of time and energy. So it is coming out. Stuff takes time, um, as you know. So, again, I do appreciate all the support. If you haven't hit the thumbs up on the, the video, please hit the thumbs up. YouTube has been very... Um, I guess steering away from some and not sending out notifications. So if you don't get a notification, hit the bell again and, and re uh, decide on what you want to do on your notifications because YouTube has been steering a lot towards the, uh, the, the latest issue with the pandemic. So uh, again, uh, one more thanks to Dom. Dom's always very great to have him on the show. I do enjoy talking with Dom. We've both been very busy lately, so I haven't talked to him nearly as much. We both have some other personal things that we've got to deal with too. So, you know, life goes on for everybody. The biggest point and the last remark I will make is don't panic. No matter what, you know, we're talking about or whatever is going on, I'm not going to panic over it. It's not going to fix or solve anything. Life will continue and will go on. Business will still be here. Reselling will be here. It's been here since God, since there was something to resell. It has been here on this planet and it's not going anywhere. There's a lot of opportunities. So just stay with it. It's going to take time and, and energy. And, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, Don, want to wave goodbye and I'll wave goodbye right. and we will send Thanks it on, off on our way. See you at the next show.
Oh, I'm frozen. 